on worship. And the church uploaded it to the website. And as of today, it has 762,000 views in over 129 different countries around the world. And that's not because I'm the best preacher ever. I believe that's because God is seeking worshipers, and he wants his people to know what worship is. Now, this short video I'm going to play you is the introduction to that message, and I want to play it on a video because it lines up with an illustration that I use, and if I were to just tell it to you, you wouldn't have the visual to go along with it. So, Coach, if you could play that video, and hopefully it has sound. No sound, coach? And every once in a while, they panned out to the crowd to show their response to Michael. And there were tens of thousands of people there um, holding on to every word that he sang, completely fixated on this man, obsessed almost. And every time they zoomed in, there were people crying, uh, bawling even, almost ripping out their hair because of Michael. And it seemed as if every time they panned in on the first two rows, there were people being pulled over the security rail by the guards because they had fainted. They passed out because of Michael. I didn't know what it was then, but I know what it was now. They were worshiping him. A man that would never do anything for them, wouldn't sit and listen to them cry and comfort them, wouldn't provide for their needs or bless them, wouldn't really love them and fill that void in their life. But they worshipped him. And then I go to some churches or youth gatherings. And during the 15 minutes, we're called to worship a God who does sit and listen when we cry and comfort us, who does provide all of our needs and bless us, who does love us more than we could ever imagine, who does fill the void in our life. That 15 minutes when we're called to worship the God who took all of our sins upon himself as he suffered and died on the cross, we don't even sing. But if our favorite artist comes on the radio, we sing and dance every word. If someone mentions the president, we get all worked up about him. If our favorite sports team is playing, everything else shuts off. But when it comes time to worship the God who created and saved our life, we stand as if we have no life. Or we're on our phones, texting, emailing, checking our social media feeds, we're looking around, having all-out conversations with those around us. Now, not all of us, not all the time, but most of us, most of the time. Now listen, I'm not being legalistic right now, nor am I standing up here as a person who thinks he's better than you as if I have all this stuff right. I stand up here convicted of not worshiping at times as well. Listen, I've walked out of some worship services because I didn't like the singing. I didn't know the songs. I believe that's why the Holy Spirit moved me to teach on this subject because perhaps we don't know what worship is. I didn't know until I studied it. So what is it? What is worship. If we were to ask most church people what worship is, they'd probably say it's a time during service where we sing songs. And that's partly correct. Singing songs is part of worship, just like preaching and praying and studying. But worship is more than just that. 
Don't get so caught up in the singing part. My greatest moments of worship have come with no song whatsoever. So what is it? What is worship? Coach, slide. To keep it simple, we'll define worship as the activity of glorifying God in his presence with our voices and heart. And by voices, we don't just mean singing. We mean all of the time. Everything in our life should be an act of worship, not just that short time we set aside to sing. Everything we do is to the glory of God, not just that short time when we are in this building. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle. One of the primary reasons God calls us into this building is so that we may worship corporately. In Exodus 7, God demanded Pharaoh to let his people go so that they may worship him corporately in the desert. Coach, we can therefore expand on that definition of worship and say it's a direct expression of our ultimate purpose for living, to glorify God and fully enjoy him forever. Coach, it's the outward display of our inward belief, and we're commanded to do it. It's a privilege. It's an honor, and it's the proper response to God. God initiates worship by revealing himself to us. We then respond. And the more we get to know him, the better we can worship. And it's amazing when done properly because in the context of singing, in the context of singing when we worship properly, we join the innumerable angels and saints who have gone before us in worship, Hebrews 12, 22, which is crazy to even think about, but it strengthens our faith. Listen, when we worship properly, we declare these words we sing as truth. We hear ourselves sing them. We hear those around us sing them. We pray them, we're ministered to, we're encouraged. It stirs up the spirit within us and we're almost transformed and elevated in a sense because we are in the presence of God. A student said to me earlier this week that they have no desire to worship, that they don't connect or identify with Christian music. They have no Christian music on their playlist. Mm, I'm sorry, my response was perhaps because you're not saved. Now, that doesn't mean being a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, you can't listen to secular music. I listen to songs that are not Christian. What I mean is this. If you can listen to music that is degrading to women, talks about sex, drugs, murder, money, the things of this world, and have no spiritual conviction within you regarding that, then you need to examine yourself because you may not be in the faith. One of the first things God did in my life once I was saved is I no longer had an ear for the things that I used to listen to. What's on your playlist? You're not going to know worship songs if you're not listening to worship songs. If someone not in the faith were to look at your playlist, would they know you're a Christian? One of the things the spirit within you wants to do is worship. And if you have no desire to worship, then you need to check yourselves. If the time for worship comes and you just stand there dead, you need to check yourselves. We've mentioned time and time again that one of the reasons that teenagers leave the church once they become a young adult is because they never experience God. Well, perhaps one of the ways, reverse that, one of the reasons teenagers leave the church when they become adult is because they never experience God. Well, one of the ways to experience God is worship. Just like seeing God and hearing God. We've taught that. Next week, we're going to teach on prayer, which is another way to experience God. Could it be that some of you have not experienced God or had an encounter with God because you're not worshiping? So how do we do it? How do we worship? What makes worship worship? What is real worship? Let's find out. Be in John 4. We have it on the, on the slide. John 4. Let me give you some background. In John 4, Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Galilee from Judea. And in order to get there, they had to pass through a central territory called Samaria. And while passing through, Jesus sits down to rest by a well while his disciples were in town getting food. And the Samaritan woman shows up at the well to get water. And they begin to have this conversation. And at one point, the topic of worship comes up in verse 20. And this is the only time I believe Jesus teaches on worship. 
And he uses just four words. Four words, and those are the words we want to talk about today. In verse 20, she says to Jesus, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now, a part of the controversy at that time was where was the proper place to worship. The Jews believed the temple in which David built in Jerusalem was the place based on things that God has said in the past, but Samaritans believed Mount Gerizim near Shechem was the place based on things that God has said and done in the past. And we have similar issues like this today in the church, don't we? Some churches say you have to sing hymns only. While others say contemporary, some churches say you need a choir, some say a band, some say just one person. Instruments, do we use instruments? Are we to sing a cappella? Do we need an organ? Some churches are a little charismatic and may raise their hands during worship. Others, you can't even sneeze. How do we dress? Casual? Business? All these rules, rituals, and restrictions that man has placed on worshiping God. So what's the correct way to worship? Jesus answers. Verse 21, Jesus says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So he's saying the real issue is not where God's people worship him, but how God's people worship him. So how are God's people to worship him? Verse 22, you, being plural, worship what you do not know. The Samaritans didn't really know God. Moreover, they added pagan concepts to their faith. Continuing, he says, we, the Jews, Worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus came from the Jews. 23. But the hour is coming and is here now. The Messiah is here when the true worshipers, that's who we want to be, will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. That's probably why there's 762,000 views of this. The Father is seeking people who worship him like this. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, what does that mean? In order to worship, we must worship in spirit and in truth because the in refers to both spirit and truth here. And those are our four words. In spirit, in truth. That's how we worship. Let's break this down. We'll start out with in spirit coach. How do we worship in spirit? Is this some out of body? Is this some out of body experience? Is this some some trance? We need to enter into how do we how do we do this there's three different things the first one is in spirit spiritual life in spirit proceeds from a person who has spiritual life meaning the holy spirit has regenerated or caused that person to be born again this is not something that can be self-generated or worked up within ourselves by ourselves worship takes place in the spiritual realm it's a spiritual activity empowered by god the holy spirit working within us. So if you don't have spiritual life, if you're spiritually dead, then you can't worship in spirit. And so you're not worshiping at all. This means we must pray that the Holy Spirit will enable us to worship right. So let's take care of that right now for anyone who is spiritually dead here. This is the gospel. In the beginning, God created humans And he set forth laws, rules, and commandments for us to adhere to, to live by, in order to keep us holy and in good standing with him. But we, through our own freedom of choice, chose to break those laws, disobey those rules, not keep those commandments. This act, which is called sin, separated us from God. And since sin is dirty, and because God is holy, he can't be anywhere near it. Therefore, he can't be anywhere near us because we're all guilty of it. There's nothing we can do on our own to get back right with God. No works, no donations, no religion, no philosophy, nothing. That sin requires punishment, penalty, payment, and it's death. And God knows this, and God doesn't want this for anybody. So what God did, because he loves you so much, is he sent his one and only son, who himself is fully God. And this son, Jesus lived the life that God requires of us, for us. Paid the price that God requires of us, for us. Raised on the third day and is now offering the free gift of eternal life to us. All you have to do right now is repent. 
change the way you think about God, sin, your life, the way you live, and place your personal trust in Jesus Christ as a living person for the forgiveness of your sins and everlasting life. It's that easy. Pray that God would seal you with the promised Holy Spirit and cause you to be born again, and so begins your spiritual life and relationship with God. And as someone who didn't grow up in the church and was saved eight years ago, this stuff is real. I promise you. Moving on. Coach, second, in spirit means since God is spirit, he's not in any one place. He's not just in a temple, not just at the peak of one mountain, not just in a church building. He's everywhere all the time so you can worship him wherever. Lastly, coach, and this is the big one. This is the big one. In spirit means with your whole heart engaged, your whole mind, your whole everything. Romans 12, 1, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Your bodies, meaning everything that's contained within you. It's not just standing and singing. It's not just preaching a sermon. It's not just observing ordinances. It's putting your entire being into it, being fully, holy, 100% focused on him and him alone while doing these things. Nothing else should matter during worship. Nothing else should grab your attention. Nothing should enter your mind or heart when you are worshiping in spirit. You're not looking at your phone. You're not thinking about the ride home, school tomorrow. You're not thinking how you sound to the people around you. You're not thinking about how the people around you sound. You're not worried about who's looking at you. Nothing is in your mind. You're fully, 100% focused on God in spirit. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 8, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So let me ask you this. If outsiders came into this church at our meeting during our worship service, When we're worshiping, would they know we're worshiping God? Would they know that you, personally, are worshiping God? Those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. Not just in spirit, in truth as well. It may be possible to worship in spirit, but not in truth. There are some crazy Christians down south that dance with snakes. Or they cut themselves. Or they roll around on the ground barking like dogs. I've been to a service like this. And their whole heart's engaged. They're 100% in this. But there's no truth in that. A true worshiper of God must worship in spirit and in truth. So what does in truth mean? There are three different things about in truth. Coach, in truth means with true hearts. It's sincere. You mean it. It's intentional. It's not, oh, it's time for worship. Let's just sing songs. Okay. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, my soul. It's not going through the motions or worshiping for what we can get out of it. It's not running up and down the aisles just to draw attention to yourself. You do what you do because it's true. It's genuine. It's authentic. Second, coach, in truth means according to the word of truth. The gospel of salvation, worshiping God in truth, requires, requires that we believe, trust, and profess God to be who he says he is in Scripture and that we praise, thank, and honor him for his true character and actions. We're actually believing the words that we're singing. That's what it is. We're actually believing the words that we're singing. Lastly, in truth means in Christ, who is truth. And it's through him and only him that we have access to the Father. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's supposed to be one row in between two, in, in, in between you guys. Those who worship him must worship in truth. Not just in truth, but in spirit as well. It may be possible to worship in truth, but not in spirit. Some people have all this head knowledge 
and become so legalistic and strict in their outlook that they have little to no emotion when worshiping God, and they only worship because they know that's what they're supposed to do, rather than actually wanting to do it and meaning to do it. A true worshiper of God must worship in spirit and in truth. John Piper sums all this up in one short, one short quote. He says, together the word spirit and truth mean that real worship comes from the spirit within based on true views of God. Worship must have heart and worship must have head. Worship must have heart and worship must have head. Worship must engage your emotions and worship must engage your thought. This is the kind of worshiper that God seeks. This is the kind of worshiper that God seeks. In spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. So at this time, we have three worship songs that I'm sure all of you should know, and we're going to worship in spirit and in truth.